the big snow of 1947. It snowed for three days. It stayed on the ground for months. Around the back to ditches and on the mountain, it last round to me. It brought with it cold, hunger, havoc, death. The roads, roads are all closed everywhere. And a neighbour of mine over the road here died and they couldn't get out with them. They couldn't bring the body away to the church. And many stories. At the age of 10, I realised there was huge distress and I always remember those poor tinkers out at the Furnace Hill. That is a lasting memory I have. And people, I must say, reacted. Hello and welcome to a very special programme where we look back at the big snow of 1947. My name's Mike Mulvihill. And to start with, for comparison, the most recent big freeze, which I can remember, happened in 2010. Others can recall a snowstorm in the 1960s. But let's rewind a few years. From the middle of January 1947, some parts of Ireland had experienced snow on and off, with very cold Arctic conditions recorded for that time. On Monday, February 24th, 1947, Irish people went to bed. And when they awoke on Tuesday, the ground was covered in a white blanket of snow. An east wind caused a blizzard where huge snowdrifts occurred. It forced the country to come to a complete halt and continued snowing and stormy well into March, with the thaw not happening until April. Some recall there's still been snow on the ground in May of 1947. Food on the shelves was running out. Fuel for the fire was getting scarce. Water wells, which people depended on, were now covered over with snow and ice. Some people had resorted to boiling snow and ice to try and get by. Farmers were finding it tough to fodder animals and to run the land. For anyone wanting to buy hay, they most likely had to pay top price and might even be buying old hay from previous years, such was the demand at that time. Because of the snowdrifts, some people found it hard to even leave their house. There are many quotes describing the big snow, Milk froze in bottles and could be eaten from broken bottles like ice cream or lollipops. De Valera was in power and his Fianna Fáil party got the blame in some cases for the bad weather. On the other side of things, 1947 had a lovely summer, many recalled, and when it came to sport, it was a little different too, with Cavan beating Kerry in the All-Ireland final which was played that year in the Polo Grounds, New York. New York's Polo Grounds. Fans playing and thousands of enthusiastic Irish, Irish-Americans and Americans to greet the Cavan and Kerry teams as they walk onto the field. On this programme, we hope to preserve the memory of the big snow of 1947 by talking to people who witnessed this weather event. I visited Pat and Peggy Flynn's house in Gowley, Kesh Carrigan. Pat, at the time of the big snow in 1947, was working with Leitrim County Council. All main roads at that time, all council staff, our employees were out with shovels, shoveling the snow. And they shoveled the snow to leave a passage for food to get into the shops. There was no traffic on the road at that time. It was very, it was very scarce. There were no cars of any sort. It was all bicycle. But at that time, it was all on foot when the snow came. Any sickness in houses, or like that, the man in charge, or whoever was there in the house, 
he either went on horseback to the doctor in Mall or walked. And the doctor walked back with him to attend the patient. And at that time then, you know, the snow would have been very, very high. It was over ditches, some people said. The snow that we were shoveling was four to five and more in places. It drifted. It wasn't all along on the road. It drifted to certain parts of the road. And we shoveled up on the street on the ditches. They could have a passage for food to get in, lorries and vans to travel. And what about people then who were farming at that time? How did they get on with all the snow, the way that it would have covered land and covered hedges, hedgerows? They had their own stock. They had as big a stock as can you know at the present time. They had the ordinary stock and they'd be indoors. And then when it had come to the fodder, they'd have hay in the hay shed. And what about water then if there was wells covered up? You would have pools along the wires. The cattle couldn't get out and they were drank with buckets from the pool, which I did myself in my own time. When six o'clock we quit on the, the council and then I fathered and carried on with cows after that. And a lot of people would have probably grown their own food back then. Oh, yeah. Every householder had their own vegetables and had their own potatoes. And they, they didn't do much with the shop that much, you see. They didn't attend to the shop that much. But nowadays it's all shop business. But at that time, they grew their own vegetables. It was all from the land and all from the ground that the food came that time. What kind of memories do you always think of when you hear about 1947? Well, I have one memory in my mind. A death in the parish, in the height of the snow. And the way the burial took place was neighbours were very plentiful at that time and there were a lot of people around. And they gathered together and they carried the coffin of a mole on their shoulders, brushed their heads. And they carried the coffin three miles, I was like, the journey from the deceased house to the church for burial. And in that respect, there was a caretaker for the graveyard and he buried there. They commenced, there weren't much headstones that time. But that's the way the burial was done in my time. And for the, and the snow. Churches, they were open? Oh, they were open, yeah. But a lot of people at that time, it was all sidecars uh, and traps and horses. In my time, they commenced, yeah. Coming to mass, cars were not pretty for at all. The money wasn't there to get them, as far as that's concerned. But um, the horses would be taken out from the cars and over the traps at uh, mass time and tied to the, two or three or something along the along the wall, and we go to mass. Well, that time then the people had to walk to mass because they couldn't bring the cars. You see. So we're here with Porrick O'Neill from Braindrum, which is in the parish, I suppose, of Mohol now, Porrick. Yes, yeah. it's in Mohol Parish. And at the time of 1947, it would have been Gorva. It was Gorva that time, yeah. Braindrum Gorva. Yeah. So around 1947, you would have been probably in school, Porrick. It was, yeah. And on a Monday night... My father and mother were in town and I went outside about half twelve. And I could find spots hitting me. I wasn't sure if it was drizzling or rain or snow or what it was because there wasn't much light that time. No electricity. But I went back in any year and got up for school the next morning. Couldn't see a thing. The window was all blocked up. The whole lot. It was so funny to see it. <laughs> it's hard to believe it because there was so much snow fell in one night. And it snowed that whole day right into the next night and the next night again. And then it stopped. And it snowed on and off then for every, maybe a few days to be a shower, like a shower of rain coming to be a shower of snow. And that's what kept it there for so long. And then it started to freeze. We've moved to Drumshambo in County Leitrim and we're with Noel McPartland from Drumshambo, who would have been probably around 10 years of age at the time of the big snow in 1947. Yeah, just turned 10, Mike, and at, at that time, and the big snow, of course, came in February. But I, I have 
fairly good memories of it. And as we look out the window here from the museum glimpses of the past over the credit union in Drumshambo, we can see the design of the town. There's a hill there and you can just imagine the trouble that that might have caused in 1947. Well, absolutely. Uh, I remember on Church Street where I was born and reared as a 10-year-old, we woke up that morning after two or three days snow. The whole landscape had changed completely. We looked up our, our bedroom window, myself and my twin brother, Sean, and we couldn't see any houses across the street. The blizzard had blown all the snow up against... There was a wall of snow across the street. But I have one particular memory of that. Uh, Seamus Murray, God rest him, lived across the road from us in his bar and his grocery shop. And while we were looking out and seeing this big hill of snow as well in the middle of the street, we could actually step out our window if we were let and walk across to the roof and the other houses. But as we were looking out the window, there came this crack in the wall of snow and it was actually Seamus Murray opening his hall door and the snow just piled in on top of them. It was one of those great memories you have of that, that we were looking at this big white wall and suddenly on the top, in the bottom left, the door opens and he comes out and he was nearly engulfed in the snow. all closed everywhere and a neighbour of mine over the road here died and they couldn't get out with him, they couldn't bring the body away to the church so they had to keep him in the house, well they moved him out of the house after a week out to one of the barns and he was there for a month before they, they could dig the roads the whole way to Mohol from here now they, could, they had to go by Garva because they couldn't go up the straight road to Mohol from the main road the Cash Garva road and that was a bit of excitement around the place as well at that time. <laughs> See this horse and car coming and the, and the coffin on it and the whole of I mean, pushing it up the hill. And the track having to be dug out in order for all this to happen? For, for that to happen, the whole way to Mohol, up to Garv and into Mohol. Of course, that opened the road too for the people in the area to get to town. What happened around that time then with people? How did they go to Mass? Well, they didn't. Unless you got, were able to get into town. They couldn't because the priest couldn't get out to Garve at the same mass, and that's six, six miles out of Mohol, and there's no way out. That was mass out for a while, but after the funeral went through, the road was open, so we could go into Mohol that way, on the horse and cart or the horse and trap or whatever we had. And they were coming out of Mohol from Monaghan Day Fair that night or the night after, there was people lost, lost their way and got into fields and never couldn't get out of them, sunk in the snow and couldn't get out and died. They were found after. I remember one particular incident then, my uncle Johnny Doherty, who had a butcher shop just across the road from us here now. Johnny went to the Monaghan Day in Mohol, a big fair day, and he was a cattle dealer as well, but he didn't come back. And we eventually found out afterwards, himself and whoever was with them, they found their way back to Kesh. And they got into a pub in Kesh. It was probably Gertie Hordens, I'd say, at that stage. <laughs> got into the pub and they were there for several days until the snow cleared. And what everybody thought they were lost in the snow. And there were people actually lost in drifts. People that went out looking for cattle got lost and their bodies were found much, much later. But I remember another time then there was a lady out in, in Mahana who was expecting a baby. And right in the middle of those days, she had to go to hospital in Carrick. And she was brought in on a, a makeshift sleigh pulled by two horses and wrapped up in blankets. And I remember seeing her going up the hill right outside the window here, which was a huge thing to see. And she was heading in for Carrick and Shannon. And thankfully, everything worked out well. She had the baby and everything was fine. For food and fuel, water. Porrick, what did you do around this area? We must make bird cages. 
and catch the birds. And we had no meat or nothing, so we eat, eat the birds. We had our own turnips and potatoes and cabbage. And we brought them all up and put them in sheds. We dug them out of the ground and down the bog and brought them up so they wouldn't get frosted. Most of the neighbours done that. They were fairly well off for food, but for water was very hard to get after a week. As soon as the first frost came, that was the water finished for a while, except melting snow. And then after another couple of weeks, it was awfully hard to get clean snow. There was dust falling on it from somewhere. And you had to dig top of the layer of the snow and then get other snow and melt it down and melt it down. You could spend hours melting snow just for making tea and cooking at home. Just when we picture 1947, Porrick, and you're probably around eight, nine years of age, every child would be waking up, running out into yeah. the snow, but the snow was too deep for, for playing or anything like that. You couldn't play in it, but it was great fun because you were sinking down in it to your waist. <laughs> and it used to be fun pulling each other out and snowballing and everything. It used to be we used to enjoy. We enjoyed it anyway when we were young. The older people didn't like it that much. There's townhouses, both sides and shops of the street in Drumshambo and a lot of the houses would be, they're all two-storey houses. So that kind of describes exactly how high the snow was. Absolutely. On Church Street, again, uh, all two-storey houses, yes. This was really our, all our Christmases coming at the one time. We were really in clover and our, we had a lot of kids on that street. The late Paddy McManus was another neighbour of ours and Paddy McManus and Jerry McGee and the Gannons. Now, they were slightly younger, but we were all out the next day, jumping on the snow, climbing up, being at points on the street, but we never could imagine we'd get there. And it was really a joy for us. Other things we'd done very dangerous when we were kids. We went out on the lake, walked down the river to the lake, because you couldn't go through the fields, the snow was too deep. So we walked down the river... Out onto the lake, got a hammer, made a hole in the ice, and started fishing, but we didn't catch anything. <laughs> fishing through the through the ice and sliding on it. And I seen them down at corner going with riding bicycles out across the lake. So that was a big lake, you see, they had they could ride a bicycle out on the out on the ice. And then they lit a bonfire on it. So there was always something exciting for the youngsters. And I suppose just to round things up, your best memory from the big snow of 1947? Well, that would have been that funeral going up the road. Because everybody was out of their houses and pushing the cart up the hill. Because that's a steep hill out there, so they had to be pushed up. We witnessed uh, some pretty tough cases. I remember there were tinkers, and I use that word in the best possible way because there were there were very poor people and lovely people actually. But tinkers in those days had nothing, and they lived in camps just outside the town under the Furness Hill. And I remember my mother and a lot of other people bringing them out dinners and, and food. That a lot of kids as well, of course. And that was the really hard part of that particular time but uh, even at, my, at the age of 10 I realised there was huge distress and I always remember those poor tinkers out at the Furnace Hill that is a lasting memory I have and people I must say react. We move now from County Leitrim to Ballinagar in County Roscommon. Paddy Ryan, well known to listeners of Shannon Side Northern Sound for traditional music and kyoltas, joins us now for a chat about the big snow. Paddy, you have memories from that big blizzard. I have, yes. Uh, I can remember the day quite clearly uh, when when we had the, the blizzard. There was a s- storm force wind blowing and, and 
pelting snow uh, at the same time and uh, you couldn't you couldn't put your nose outside the door. The pile of s- snow that was on the road was about level with the tops of the walls each side, so you couldn't really distinguish the road from the walls. There were several feet of snow on, on all the roads and there was gangs of men digging it off the roads. And, uh, you know, there, there was a few people who died during that period and a uh, very awkward job they had to carry the coffins over the snow. And that was, that was not easy. The graveyard then, they had to get rid of several feet of snow before they could dig the grave, you see. So uh, uh, people really suffered at the time with, with uh, the, the weather situation. I was going to school at the time. I was 10 years old at that time. We, were, we had a great holiday from school, actually. Kids at the time, of course, they had a great, they had a great time playing in the snow. And uh, it, was a, it was a great wonder to the, to the kids, like, to see all this snow around and everything covered with it. When you think of 1947 and the big snow, what comes to mind? Well, uh, there's one thing I remember. The day after the blizzard, um, there was uh, a few people uh, outside on the... Well, they thought they were on the road. But (laughs) they were trying to figure out where the road was because uh, the the snow being up to the level of the tops of the walls, you couldn't distinguish by looking at it where the road was or where the wall was. So they just had to take their chance and walk wherever they were going and uh, take the risk. Well, they certainly couldn't fall off the wall anyway because they'd fall into the snow if they did. So there wouldn't be any uh, serious injuries in that case. We're with Christy Wynn Main Street in Boyle. You're very welcome, Michael. Glad to have you here. I'm Christy Wynn from uh, Main Street Boyle. I've been a news agent there for the last 50, 60 years and uh, I'm still here. And you've got some fantastic stories in a book here, uh, which you've written over the years. And one of those in the book is a recollection of the blizzard of 1947. Yeah, that's right, Michael. I was only 10 years old uh, on that occasion. It, it happened on the night of the Monday, the 24th of February, 1947. I was just 10 years of age. But I actually went to school that day. But Mother God rest her, I think, didn't realise how, how heavy the snowfall was like until perhaps later on that morning. But however, I did head off to school that particular morning, so I have written a little story about it. Would you like me to read a little extract from it? We'd love to hear it. Right, Michael, thank you. It began on the night of the 24th of January 1947. The greatest snowfall of the century was on its way. Today it's just remembered simply as the blizzard. As I look back on those far-off days when I was a young 10-year-old, I recall in a special way the words of a favourite poet of mine, William Wordsworth, when he wrote, Bliss was it in that dawn to be alive, but to be young was very heaven. And so it was. For weeks before, an Arctic wind had been blowing across the land and snow was the topic on everybody's lips. As I went to bed on that Monday night, dreaming dreams, the first flakes were beginning to fall. Next morning when I woke up and looked down on the street below, I could barely recognise it. Shop fronts, shop windows, hall doors had literally disappeared under a massive blanket of snow. The rooftops opposite looked strangely different with their snow-capped chimneys standing out stark and weird against the snow-filled sky. The birds that chattered each morning on the moss-covered slates and perched in a row along the telegraph lines were nowhere to be seen. You've painted some lovely pictures there, Christy, of 1947. And you can just picture the the chimneys covered in snow. The snow, it really was high at the time. Oh, it was. I mean, it it snowed for almost three days. It snowed all that Monday night, Tuesday, and into midday on Wednesday. So continuously, like non-stop as far as I can truly recall. There was certainly an average of six, seven foot of snow on the streets. But there were uh, uh, places uh, in the fields and uh, there were snow drifts as high as 15, 20 feet against gable walls and in the fields outside town, you know. The the Boyle town was actually isolated. No buses could come through or trains for four or five days at least, if not a week. 
And of course, there was no school, which was which was the icing on the cake for a young ten-year-old. But like the snow level on the ground on the Tuesday morning would be surely two, three foot deep. It snowed all Tuesday, and it snowed all Tuesday night and into Wednesday about midday. So that the end result was that, like, uh, the streets of Boyle would, would probably have an average of five, six, seven foot of snow, six foot of snow at least. And the fields outside, like, uh, the, the snow had reached the same level as the ditches in the fields, which mean the, the landmarks that we knew as children were actually lost for a while, had disappeared. And Noel McPartland, at the start of the programme, he spoke about, you know, the snow been in Drumshambo up to the top windows and that you could come out on from your top window and walk across the snow to the roof of the other house. Yes, is it would be not 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 unsimilar here here in Boyle. There was similar similar situations, and uh, of course there were stories of a postman getting lost in the snow because he went off on his delivery that morning in the early hours, not realizing again uh, maybe uh, the amount of snow that that had fallen, and he was he had to cover a rural area out near Lagara. A number of townlands out there, um, Ballinulta, Tony Tuscan, or Tony Aden, I should say, Colonel Meal to Derry Nockerton, overlooking the a b- beautiful area in summer, but it was completely isolated. And uh, the, uh, the uh, Johnny, the postman, failed to return home, so it transpired he, he was missing or lost until the following Saturday when he eventually got back into Boy. But he was he was found by a, a farmer out. Uh, looking for his sheep, and he found Johnny in one of his out out offices or sheds, and he was he was almost fr- frozen to death, like he was he was semi conscious, and he brought him to his home, and he kept them there from the from the Tuesday until the following Saturday, and eventually, like he was able to get him back into Boyle, so that was that was one of the famous stories. From from the blizzard and actually the house that harboured them or the Good Samaritan, it's still there. There's a different man in it now, but uh, the same house is still standing. And uh, in any time a snowfall comes about, the house is pointed out as the house that saved Johnny Gormley, the postman. So our journey. For the big snow has taken us to Clune in County Leitrim. We're in O'Higgins's shop and we're joined by Oliver. There was a fair in Mohold, Manhunday it was known as, and the people got lost at the fair because of all the snow and they couldn't get home because the so much snow came all in an impact on top of other and it was very difficult for the people to get home or to find their way home because everywhere looked so different, everything had changed. And the people, of course, that some of them had to stay back in Mohold and there were people from other faraway places that were arrived that day and they had to wait for a couple of days before they could get away and... Uh, some of them got lost on their way home. And the whole geography of the area would have been completely covered in snow. Oh, there was six and seven foot of snow in places and people just couldn't, couldn't imagine that there was so much snow all in the one go. And it was a terrible experience for everybody. And then there was a lot of cattle that uh, was out in, in meadows and not in out in fields and all that. And they were they were lost up as well. And they had a difficult job to be able to recover. And they didn't even know where they were because they all looked the same. They were all white with snow on them. They couldn't swing you distinguish uh, one from another. The, the field or the cow, and you wouldn't recognise because everywhere is in a terrible state. If I was to say to you a memory that you can remember the minute the big snow of 1947 is mentioned, what would it be? Well, the biggest thing I think of all at that time in 1947 was the, the people to got up, and, well, what really happened in the old days, the people got up the next morning and it seemed like they, they couldn't just know that for the time of morning it was. Everywhere was dark all covered, were covered up with snow and they couldn't even know what time of the day it was because there wasn't many clocks around that time where there are today and even if there were clocks about they didn't, the society people didn't even know to tell the time. Met Aaron wrote on the winter of 1946-47 
that the early months of 1947 saw the most persistent cold spell of the century with snowfalls affecting all parts of the country from late January until mid-March. Although heavier individual snowfalls have been recorded, notably in January 1917, at no other time in the recent past has there been such a period of continuous cold weather. Following the disastrous harvest of 1946 and the extension of wartime rationing of food and fuel, the severe weather caused hardship for many people and disrupted the country's communication and transport facilities for several weeks. Early 1947 was very wet and stormy, with flooding in many places. But it was not until January 24th that the spell of severe cold weather began. By the beginning of February, there was already reports of skating on frozen ponds and the unrelenting cold continued until the middle of March. The temperatures did not rise above 5 degrees at Dublin Airport between January 22nd and March 7th and on most days during this period, the temperatures struggled to rise above freezing. In addition, a harsh easterly wind persisted for several weeks as the normal run of Atlantic depressions was diverted to the south of the country. There were between 20 and 30 days with snowfall in most places during this time and snow lay on the ground at Dublin Phoenix Park for all but two days between January 26th and March 8th. Even at Valencia Observatory, where there would normally be snow on around four days during the first three months of the year, snowfall was recorded for a total of 50 hours over 14 days during the cold spell. Different areas of the country experienced heavy snow at various times throughout the period of severe cold, with the most notable falls on February 2nd, 8th, 21st and 25th and on the 4th of March. The country's telephone system had barely recovered from the major snowfall of February 2nd when what was described by one newspaper as the Great Blizzard of February 25th. Thereafter, amounts of snow were on the decrease, even though light falls were reported as late as March 24th. That piece was taken from Met Erin's history on the winter of 1946-1947. And as we've been hearing on this programme, around this region, snow was witnessed on high ground and on mountains up until May of 1947. And if you're into the sport, the GA All-Ireland final played in... New York. New York, Kerry and Cavan. That's right, yeah. I remember that when they were going, they were saying, Where, where's that Ireland going to be this year? And I think it was played in New York. <laughs> so that was another thing that from that year. Oh, yeah, I can remember that quite well. My father, as well as having a shop in the Hackney, he was a radio dealer and he used to sell radios. And we used to uh, go out with him putting up these radios in the country houses. And there's one quick little story I'm going to tell about that. Because the radio was a huge uh, advance for us, uh, technologically speaking. (laughs) And I suppose the radio station at that time, Radio Athlone, was it? Athlone, yeah. Radio Erden. And uh, when he'd go out to put up, he'd sell the radio, he'd go out, put it up put the, it um, was the wet and dry battery radio, I have one here at the back of the shop, and uh, but the All-Ireland Final of 47 Cavan and Curry. our little shop was packed because he had a radio up on a glass case and you could hear Mihal O'Hare's voice coming through as if it was, cro- it was crossing the Atlantic of course, but it was coming through in waves New York Polo Grounds. Bands playing and thousands of enthusiastic Irish, Irish Americans and Americans to greet the Cavan and Kerry team as they walk onto the field. But he gave a huge account. He was a fantastic man. He gave a huge account of the match and the place was packed. The radio could be heard out on the street and anybody that had a radio, their houses were packed as well. So that was the All-Ireland Final of 47. Thank you. 
Now we have a recording of an interview which was broadcast on Shannon's Eye Northern Sound in 2006 on The Joe Finnegan Show. Joe is in conversation with Jim, who was a farmer in 1947 and is recalling what farming was like during the big snow. So it was one day and I'd thrown cattle out on a hill that run down to the lake and it was frozen over. So I thought I'd take the axe down with me and cut a hole in the ice to let the animals to see a drink. So I went down and it was a good while I had with the axe before I got through it. Oh, the ice could have been six or seven inches deep. And when I was at it to come, a slight shower of snow, you know. And it had kind of lit on the grass and on the lake. It was a kind of all the same colour then. So I canal caught and went up to drive down the bullocks to get a drink. And what they do, they gallop down and out on the lake. There'd be about 800 each. And sure, my heart nearly went through my mouth. But says I, how are we going to get them in? One fell all together and the four legs went out each direction. But the rest of them held their feet. So they shivered a lot and they come back in and said, I know I'll have to go to round the neighbours and gather up ropes and tie it on a man and let him walk out on the ice and hook it on the bullock and we can drag him in quite easy then. But he got up and walked in and come back up to the other one. So I was delighted. A radio station was established in Athlone in 1932 to coincide with the staging of the Eucharistic Congress. It became known as Radio Athlone. And in this next clip from that interview with Jim on The Joe Finnegan Show in 2006, here they discuss Radio Athlone, which was receivable across virtually the entire country. The only radio we had was Radio Athlone. You remember that? This is Radio Athlone. I know that when when I was younger, coming down to Boyle, down to Lock Key, and it's now uh, a huge uh, family place for weekends and during the week as well, where people go to walk and there's great activities to do there at Lock Key. But in 1947, I'm trying to visualise what it would have been like during the big snow. Yeah, there's no doubt it was extraordinary in the sense that uh, to see a lake frozen over was unbelievable certainly for a 10-year-old. So I, I'll read a little extract of what I, I wrote about it from my memory of it. During all this period, Lock Key was frozen over and it too became a winter playground. Stories survive of Cayley dances being held along the lake shore at Smotherna, a little townland down at the bottom of the lake. Uh, with bonfires ablaze and the sound of accordions and bowrons echoing across the frozen waste as the dancing continued into the early hours. Una Vaughan and her lover Tom Costello would have loved every minute of it as they listened to it from their quiet, lonely graves on far off Trinity Island. The fun and sport came to a peak on Sundays when many took to skating on the frozen lake. A vantage point on top of the Rock of Dune gave one a panoramic view. It was a beginner's paradise with the young and old indulging in a sport that was unlikely to be seen ever again on Lock Key. So people were out on, on Lock Key and like the water is, walking, the water is deep the there. Island, walking uh, literally groups of people walking to the island. Uh, I remember seeing them from the dune shore, people walking to Church Island. And it was unbelievable to say that, that people could actually walk to an island. And as regards the Cayley, the Cayley dancing down at Corrigan Row, which is down near the end of the lake where it joins up with the Shannon, it was literally people dancing on ice. I'm told, like, I, I, I wasn't down there, but I remember being told that a bonfire may be just on the shoreline, of course, mm. but with bowrons and fiddles and accordions and a, a group enjoying life, they were actually out on the ice dancing. So it was a story of dancing on ice.
Going back to your selection of short stories, Christy, you've got another story here. Yeah, well, I, well, I have one like that. I, I was, uh, I, I refer to the man as the marathon man. If you can, if you like, I read, read, read a few lines of it because this gentleman who is dead now, he told me his story a few years just before he died. Of the many stories of courage and endurance to come out of that period, one of the most memorable for me must be that of the Marathon Man. Patrick told me his story some months before he died, and it surely is one for the record books. He left his home about five miles outside Boyle, late on the Monday evening of the blizzard, on his bicycle. His destination was Kiluni Railway Station, about 20 miles away, where he was to board a train for Enniskillen and thence to Belfast, where he did business a number of times a year. It was a journey he had made on numerous occasions before and thought little of it. When he set out that evening, the weather was extremely cold but dry, and a short time later it started to snow. Conditions were getting worse by the minute and the blinding snow made it impossible for him to cycle. When he eventually reached Ballymore, 10 miles on, he left his bicycle at the railway station in the care of the station master, a man he knew well. He then continued his journey on foot to Colony, which was another 10 miles, and eventually arrived there cold, weather-beaten and very disappointed. All transport had been cancelled due to the awful weather conditions, so his marathon journey had all been in vain. But he now faced a new and tougher challenge or task as he had to find his way back home all the way on foot, which was 20 miles away. He couldn't afford to be away at home for an indefinite period of time. The snow on the roads had now reached this same level as the ditches, blotting out practically every landmark that one might be familiar with. A sea of white stretched to the horizon on all sides. For Patrick, the situation looked hopeless. Then the proverbial spark from heaven came his way. Across the fields in the distance, he recognised the stretch of telegraph poles that run parallel with the railway track. Slowly and doggedly, he struggled across the frozen landscape till he reached the embankment and slid his way down onto the Dublin Sligo railway line. From there he continued his marathon journey along this track through Ballymoat Station, Kilfree Junction and Mullock Row, a little townland outside Kilfree Junction, a distance of almost 15 miles. Knowing him was in home territory near Mullock Row Bridge, he left the railway track and continued the last five miles of his extraordinary journey by road. The marathon man had made his way home and his story is now part of local history. On a previous documentary that we worked on, Noel, The Narrow Gauge, yeah. how did it operate during that time? Well, I was trying to think of that, uh, Mike, in advance of this interview and I think it didn't operate for probably, see, the line had to be cleared. All the lines were blocked. But I would say they had a better way of doing it now than than volunteers because they had these uh, cow catchers on the front of the engines that was able to clear their way. So they probably got going within the week, I would imagine. Again, that was another place we used to go on and play and, and it was just heaven for us. There's lots of varying stories about how long the snow lasted, Noel. Some recall there's still been snow on the mountain in May of 1947. Yeah, well, I would agree with that. I would even even go further because there was no way of disposing of the snow, but they had to clear the streets. So they banked up huge blocks of snow each side of an entrance to a house or a gateway. And there were blocks of snow all over the town that time and they were there I'd say well into May if not further because it, they just melted away naturally It must have stayed on, there was still some on the mountain in May around that time and I think it was April before we got back to school Around the back to ditches and on the mountain it lasted on to May but generally the road was quite clear before that long before that I remember like there was several 
gangs of men out then afterwards, uh, clearing the snow off the roads. It, it took a couple of months before everything was cleared up again. As the days passed, the frozen snow had turned the town into a winter playground, with Green Street and the Crescent transformed into a skating rink. Lorries, cars were in short supply in those days, so there was little problem for the youth to try out their skills. Anything that moved on ice made its appearance. Push cars, broken down prams, enamel basins, aluminium trays, stools on their end could be seen racing helter-skelter down the hill with children hanging on for dear life. The sound of laughter was everywhere. And if or when a minor collision did occur, few tears were shed. All was forgotten in the sheer joy of the moment. I hope you enjoyed listening to the stories of the big snow of 1947. And hopefully this programme will preserve the big snow's memory. To finish this programme, Christy Wynn from Main Street in Boyle will recount another story from his personal collection of stories. I'd like to thank everyone who contributed to this programme and I'd like to wish you all a very happy Christmas. Youth was having the time of his life and could do no wrong. Finally, after the biblical 40 days, the great thaw had set in. As the ice melted on the roofs, huge slabs crashed onto the streets below like a clap of thunder. Yes. Any, any loiter unlucky to be caught under one of them would hardly rise again. It was the end game and there was a terrible finality about it. The great blizzard was at an end and we were watching its death throes. It was unlikely we would ever see anything like it again in a lifetime. For the young it was indeed the best of times. For the old and infirm it was probably the worst of times. And for the birds of the air and the animals of the fields it must surely have been a nightmare.